I'd like to um, welcome Dr. Anna Blakely, who will present her research on how molecular engineering enhances immunogenicity of self-amplifying RNA vaccines. Um, Dr. Blakely is currently a Marie Curie Research Fellow at Imperial College London. She is a bioengineer with training in biomaterials, drug delivery, immunology, and formulation science for the treatment and or prevention of infectious diseases. Her current research focuses on the optimization of self-amplifying RNA vaccines, which has recently culminated in the Shattuck Labs SARS-CoV-2 vaccine efforts. So we're very excited to listen to her speak today. Um, and Anna, I'll just stop sharing my screen and let you share yours. Cool. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks for the nice introduction. And I'm really excited to present to you guys today. So thanks for attending. So as Caroline said, my presentation today is going to be on uh, our work for using molecular engineering to enhance the immunogenicity of our self-amplifying RNA vaccines. So just a brief outline of my presentation. So I'm going to kind of go over the current challenges in vaccine development and why we are going to need uh, different types of vaccines for the future. I'll then cover how we use molecular engineering to enhance immunogenicity of our SARNA vaccines. I'll touch on the development and progress of our SARS-CoV-2 SARNA vaccine, um, as well as speak really briefly on the future of vaccine manufacturing and how I think this will change um, for future pandemics. So to start off, uh, why do we need new types of vaccines? There's already lots of vaccines that are licensed and approved, and so why do we need to improve upon these? So really the reason, um, there's a few that we focus on. So really uh, one of the main ones is that there's still a lack of efficacious treatment for many devastating infections. Um, we've in recent years seen this emergence of multi-drug resistant bacteria. We are always looking to improve the safety profile of licensed vaccines. One that's very obvious to us now is disease outbreaks and being able to make vaccines quickly um, when there are new pathogens. Something we also need to consider is the changing age structure of the population. So as people live longer and there's more old people in the population, um, they generally respond less well to vaccines. So we start to need to start to think about different ways of vaccinating the elderly. Um, and also we're always looking to reduce the cost and time required to produce new vaccines. So the type of vaccines that we work on really um, address kind of these two categories. So uh, disease outbreaks um, like COVID-19, as well as reducing the cost and time required to produce these vaccines. So I wanted to start off just really general for those of you who aren't as familiar with the field. So what is a nucleic acid vaccine? Uh, so this, the definition is really the use of RNA or DNA to express an antigen and thus induce an immune response. Um, so for all nucleic acid vaccines, um, it requires a delivery vehicle that gets the nucleic acid into the cytoplasm for RNA or the nucleus for DNA and that also protects it from degradation. So on the right here are the two nucleic acids that people use, um, so DNA and RNA. So there's a number of advantages of nucleic acid vaccines compared to different types of vaccines. So I think this is really well illustrated um, by this uh, figure in the top left, um, which really compares both the safety and efficacy of current types of vaccines. So on the right, we have replicating vectors. So this includes uh, live attenuated viruses as well as just replicating vectors. And on the left, we have non-replicating vectors. So this is everything from inactivated viruses or virus-like particles, um, subunit vaccines, as well as nucleic acid vaccines. And you'll see that as the safety profile increases, um, the, eff the efficacy profile goes down. So, which kind of makes sense, right? So if you um, are using a live attenuated virus, this is evolved over, uh, over time to infect us more um, readily and also induce an immune response. So th these are often the most efficacious vaccines. Um, however, because they're you know, sometimes live attenuated viruses, there's often more safety concerns. So something we have to keep in mind is that for nucleic acid vaccines, they're generally very safe, but we have to really um, optimize them for the efficacy. 
down here is just a general schematic of how we make nucleic acid vaccines. Um, so it usually includes some sort of genetic material from the pathogen. We put that into an empty plasmid and make a new plasmid. Um, we then use this or an RNA transcribed from the DNA as the vaccine um, in, in patients. So the advantages of nucleic acid vaccines is that it really, um, the speed of development. So it's a lot easier to make than proteins or viral vectors. Uh, partially because of this, it's also cheaper per dose. So they're generally more affordable. Uh, you can encode any antigen. So as long as you know the protein that you want to encode, um, you can make a nucleic acid vaccine for it. Um, they're also generally safer, as I said earlier. They're thermostable. Um, you can make proteins that have post-translational modifications for them, and you can also express membrane-bound proteins. So we specifically use self-amplifying RNA vaccines. Um, so this on the left here are the three different nucleic acids that people have used for vaccines. So plasma DNA at the top, which you'll notice is a circular uh, double-stranded um, construct usually around 7,000 base pairs for the ones we use in our lab. Uh, mRNA, which is single-stranded um, and linear, which is much smaller, around 2,000 nucleotides, as well as self-amplifying RNA, which is very similar in structure to the mRNA, um, but much longer, so usually around 10,000 nucleotides. So if we compare self-amplifying RNA to plasma DNA, um, the advantage is that it doesn't require penetration into the nucleus, so it's easier to deliver. It's also safer as there's no risk of integration into the host genome. Compared to messenger RNA, the self-amplification property, so once it gets the, into the cytoplasm, it's able to make copies of itself, which I'll talk about more on the next slide, um, which enables higher protein expression. But this also allows us to use a much smaller dose than with normal messenger RNA. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that like mRNA and plasma DNA, SARNA requires a delivery vehicle that gets it into the cell, but also protects it from degradation. So this is an example at the top of just um, kind of our classic self-amplifying RNA structure. So you'll notice that at the five prime end, it has a cap, and at the three prime end, it has a poly A tail. So this helps um, with the, the stability of it once it's in the cell. And also has an untranslated region on both the five prime and three prime end. So this helps with the replication of the construct. Uh, the next elements are these non-structural proteins, which are derived from an alpha virus, VEV in our case, and this is what forms the replication machinery. Next, we have a subgenomic promoter and untranslated region, and then our gene of interest. So for a lot of our studies, we use uh, luciferase as a reporter protein, but this is also where you would put your vaccine antigen. Down here just uh, really compares and contrasts self-amplifying RNA versus messenger RNA and how this actually works in the cells. So if we were to take one copy of messenger RNA and deliver it to the cytoplasm, um, you get you know, some protein translated from that single copy. However, if we deliver one copy of the self-amplifying RNA into the cytoplasm, it then is able to self-replicate. So you have many copies of the original RNA which are then translated to produce much more protein relative to the messenger RNA. So this won't come as a surprise to anybody, but humans are not mice, ferrets, or monkeys, which are the preclinical animal models that we usually test these in. So one of the main barriers in the field of nucleic acids is that they almost always seem like they're working really great in preclinical animal models, but then when we go to test them in humans, they often work at much lower orders of magnitude. So this is some data that was published um, in 2017, actually by Moderna, which is a company in Boston that makes modified mRNA vaccines. Um, and in this study, it's really interesting because they did it in parallel in a number of animal models, but also humans. Um, so they, they, their output here is an HAI titer. So this was an influenza vaccine. And on the y-axis, uh, they have HAI titers. So the higher this is, um, the better, which is also the correlative protection for influenza. So this is how they qualify whether the vaccine is working or not. So you can see that in mice, it got up to levels of around 1,000 um, after two doses. In ferrets, it actually reached levels of up to 10,000 for the HAI titer after two doses. They then went on to look at it in non-human primates and saw similar levels of up to 10,000 for the HAI. 
And when they did their phase one clinical trial in humans, um, they saw that the vaccine did work in humans, but the HIA titer was much lower, around 100 or less in most patients. So obviously, if you see all this preclinical data, you think this vaccine is going to be amazing. Um, but then while it worked, it's just not as staggering as the preclinical animal results. So one thing we're really interested in our lab is kind of overcoming this and understanding the mechanisms behind it. So RNA is really kind of a double-edged sword. So it's always this balance between protein expression and the adjuvant properties of RNA. So uh, because all of the cells in our bo body have evolved over time to you know, try and resist this viral infection, we've developed this type one interferon response. So foreign RNA is sensed both endosomally by TLR3, 7, and 8, as well as um, by cytosolic RNA sensing by a number of receptors such as PKR, MDA5, RIGI, as well as others that we may not even know. So this then triggers a type 1 interferon response, which um, you know, leads to dendritic cell maturation, which is good for adjuvantation, but it can also shut down protein translation. So if you deliver too much RNA, it's possible that it will just be completely shut off. So one of the things in our lab that we are looking at doing is using these interferon inhibiting proteins to get around this. So at the top here is our wild type replicon um, with our genome interest here. And we've also uh, prepared a library where we've included 10 different interferon inhibiting replicons from different viruses. So a number of viruses have naturally evolved to get around the same interferon response in response to RNA. And so we, we sought to look as to whether we could use these same proteins and kind of hijack them for our system. So it's, tra it's um, translated as a polyprotein and just uh, cleaved by a cleavage site here between our antigen and the interferon inhibiting protein. So the first thing that we wanted to do was look at, do these interferon inhibiting protein constructs enhance protein expression in vitro? So we use a number of cells here. So um, on the first one that we're looking at is hex cells. So these are actually considered to be um, less interferon competent. So they don't have a complete pathway. So they shouldn't really be responsive to these different constructs. So how this is um, uh, portrayed is as full chain. So it's normalized to the wild type vector. And then all of the different um, interferon inhibiting proteins that we screen down here. So you'll notice that most of them are around one, although two had slightly lower protein expression, just using luciferase as a reporter. We also looked at two different cell lines called HeLa and MRC5, and these two cell lines are known to be more interferon competent. So it's kind of a better way to screen these. You'll notice that um, a lot of them work better in HeLa cells, which are a little less discretionary, um, but there are kind of two that stuck out. So the PIV5V protein and the MERS ORF4A protein. So these also um, had higher protein expression in MRC5 cells, which are kind of the most interferon competent sensitive cells that we work with in the lab. So you can see here that um, while a, a number of the proteins had slightly increased um, luciferase, these two really stuck out. So um, both the PIV5V protein and the MERS ORF or A protein are what we move forward with for our studies. So one thing we wanted to get around was that we, we've often seen in our studies that if you give too much RNA, it actually dampens the protein expression. So this was an in vivo study in mice, and on the y-axis is the total flux. So this is just the total amount of luciferase expression. We imaged the mice at two different days, so at seven and 10 days, and we used three different doses of RNA, so 0.2, 2, and 20. So you can see here with our wild type luciferase that um, at a dose of 0.2, we get pretty good protein expression. It increases when we increase the dose to two, but then by the time we get to 20, it goes back down and there's actually hardly any protein expression in the animals. Um, so this is, the, this is what we're really trying to get around to where we see the point where we give too much RNA and um, we're just completely crushing the protein expression. So in this study, we are looking at the fluke also with the MERS ORF4A, and you can see here at 0.2, it's very similar to the wild type. We do see a, a slight increase, about half a log um, at the dose of two micrograms, and at 20 micrograms, we do again see a decrease, but it's not as profound as the wild type. Um, so it, it seems to partially abate this dose dependence that we're seeing. 
um, at 10 days, it had kind of, yeah, that effect had kind of gone away um, and was more normalized to the wild type. So we also wanted to test this out in a human model, um, just because we know that obviously, a la the Moderna data, um, sometimes your vaccines can look like they're working really well in preclinical animal models. Um, so we wanted to test this in a more clinically translational human model. So we're, at, we're able to get human skin explants, which are complete um, human skin from some plastic surgeons that we coll collaborate with. Um, so they're taken from either mastectomy or abdominoplasty surgeries, and then we can culture them in the lab and inject them just like we would a mouse. Um, so in this case, we use GFP as a reporter, and this is flow cytometry data. So we can look at how many cells are expressing the GFP in the human skin explants. So in this case, we use wild type B GFP, um, the PIV5B protein, as well as the MERS ORF4A. We use the same doses that we used in mice, so 0.22 and 20 micrograms. Um, and you can see here that at the 0.2 dose, there's really no difference, maybe a little bit higher with PIV5 and the ORF4A. Then with the wild type, when you increase to two micrograms, you do see slightly higher um, number of G GFP positive cells. Um, at same for the PIV5 and the ORF4A. And then finally, when you increase to a dose of 20 micrograms, again, we see this dose response curve with the GFP, um, where it's just the number of GFP positive cells uh, goes down. Um, but with the PIV5 and the MERS ORF4A, it continues to increase. So actually the effect of these interferon inhibiting proteins is much more profound in human tissue. So we wanted to look at which cells are actually expressing this RNA. So um, this is called a TC plot. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, it's like a principal component analysis for flow cytometry data. So you're, you're able to view kind of 3D data in a 2D model. Um, so it basically does unsupervised clustering of your flow cytometry data. So you don't tell it um, what any of your gate is and it just forms these clusters of cells. So that's what is presented in the gray with the live cells. Um, and then you can overlay your gating on top of it. So on top of this, I've overlaid our GFP positive cells. So you can see that within all of the live cells in our sample, um, there are some that are GFP positive, so are expressing the RNA, but some that do not. So we can then further probe into this to see um, with different cell markers and phenotypes, which ones are actually expressing the RNA. So we looked at a panel that included T cells, dendritic cells, monocytes, B cells, longer Han cells, leukocytes, epithelial cells, NK cells, and fibroblasts. And for our um, samples that got 20 micrograms with the ORF for A, these are the cells that were expressing RNA. So it's overlaid in blue for each cell phenotype. So you can see that in basically all of our immune cells, um, as well as the fibroblasts, we see pretty good GFP expression. Really the cells that um, are expressing less of the GFP are these epithelial cells. So we think that these interferon inhibiting proteins are specifically more targeting these expression in immune cells. So we then wanted to test how it how these interferon inhibiting proteins affect immunogenicity. So we used rabies as a model antigen um, and did this experiment in rabbits because they're um, thought to be more interferon competent, kind of like HeLa cells or MRC5 cells um, and more similar to humans in that way. So the constructs we used in this study are um, wild type rabies, rabies with the ORF4A, and then actually a different interferon inhibiting protein called SOX. Um, so you can see with the rabies, uh, these these animals got doses at zero and four weeks, so a prime boost regimen, and then we assayed it to look at the rabies-specific IgG uh, using an ELISA. So you can see that zero weeks, obviously um, just the background. After four weeks, we see an increase and uh, a little bit higher for the ORF4A, although very little signal from the animals that had the SOX constructs. And after six weeks, what's really interesting is that it continues to increase much higher for the ORF4A. So it's about half a log higher um, in the quantity of antibodies that we see. Um, as far as looking at uh, how functional the antibodies are, we also can characterize how um, the rabies neutralization. So we, we do this using a pseudotyped assay. So on the y-axis, it's the IC50 for the neutralization. Um, again, same time point, so zero, four, and six weeks with the same construct, so the wild type ORF4A and SOX proteins. 
So what you can see here is that um, obviously at the beginning, you know, no neutralization capacity. After four weeks, um, we see pretty good neutralization, which is then uh, enhanced for the ORF4A. So our, the neutralization continues to go up, um, at, which is also significantly higher than the wild type rabies protein. So for conclusions for this part, um, we, uh, we've observed that the interferon inhibiting proteins are able to enhance protein expression in human cells that we know are known to have a more intact interferon pathway. They're capable of rescuing these detrimental effects of increasing the dose of RNA in both mice and human skin explants. When we probe into what type of cells are expressing the RNA, it seems that the interferon inhibiting proteins enhance expression in the immune cells of the skin. And we've also observed that it enhances the immunogenicity of a rabies vaccine in rabbits. So up until this point, um, this was what the project that we were working on. And then as everybody is aware, in, in January, um, we've started to see this COVID-19 outbreak. So we pivoted our efforts to be able to make a vaccine for that. Um, so if, if for anybody who's wondering just how exactly you um, make a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, so we took the glycoprotein um, from the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we encoded the pre-fusion stabilized spike protein um, in our self-amplifying RNA. We then encapsulate that in lipid nanoparticles and then inject that intramuscularly in mice for our preclinical studies. So what I think is really um, interesting to look at is just how quickly we're able to make RNA vaccines, which is really one of the main advantages of this platform. So the circulating strain was sequenced on the 10th of January. We first accessed that sequence on the 20th of January. We ordered DNA oligos specific um, for, for these contracts on the 22nd of January. On the 28th of January, we um, had received the oligos and were able to make our constructs, our plasmids for making the RNA. On the 12th of February, we were able to confirm that um, we saw expression from our self-amplifying RNA vaccine in cells. And then the next day moved to do immunogenicity studies. Um, on the 30th of March is when we started our toxicology studies. So this is required for um, going into human clinical trials. We submitted our paper on the 22nd of April, and then our clinical trials actually started last week on the 19th of June. Um, so probably the question that everybody has is, so is the vaccine working, right? So um, what, we, what we looked at first was just the, the antibody response to our SARNA vaccine. Um, so we used a number of controls here. So we used electroporated DNA just because um, this is a really good positive control. We kind of know how it always responds in mice. Um, we also used rabies as a negative control just to make sure that the antibodies were specific for this antigen. And then we used three dis different doses of RNA formulated in lipid nanoparticles. So 10, 1, 0.1, and 0.01 micrograms. Um, we also, because we work at the hospital, were able to get Sarah early on from recovered COVID-19 patients, and we were able to run these on the same ELISA. So when we look at the SARS-2 specific IgG in all of these samples, um, you can see that we see really high levels from our RNA vaccine. So almost an order of magnitude higher than electroporated DNA. We see a really good dose response. So even with our dose of 0.01 micrograms, we're seeing really high antibody levels of up to 10 to the fifth nanograms per mil. And what's really interesting is that even after the second dose of all of our um, vaccine formulations at all the doses, we actually saw higher antibody responses than a natural infection in recovered COVID-19 patients. So we then went on to further characterize the functionality of these antibodies. So we looked at um, viral neutralization. This was actually done with a pseudotyped virus, um, but we've since done it with the wild type virus as well. So on the y-axis, again, is the IC50. We again compared it to electroporated DNA as well as the rabies control. Our four different doses of SARNA formulated in lipid nanoparticles, so 10, 1, 0.1, and 0.01, and again compared it to the neutralization capacity of recovered COVID-19 patients. So what you can see here is, again, we see really high neutralization. So it, it basically correlates directly with 
uh, the quantity of antibody in the sera. Um, so we're seeing IC50s of up to about 10 to the fifth for our highest dose. But again, we see that even with our lowest dose after lowest dose after the boost, it's still higher than uh, the neutralization IC50 for recovered COVID-19 patients. Um, so this is telling us that the the vaccine is inducing a really potent immune response. So something that we were concerned about, um, as you may have heard about this kind of uh, caution about antibody dependent enhancement. So this is what happens when you have a really low level of antibodies. Um, there have been some cases where people have observed for both SARS and MERS that it enhances the viral infection actually. So one of the ways to look at this is that ADE is usually associated with a TH2 skewed antibody response. So the, um, we, we characterize this in, in our murine studies. So the way to do this is to look at both um, the IgG1 and the IgG2A. So that's what we've done on the left for both the um, DNA as well as the RNA groups. But what really tells you um, the skewing is the ratio of these two. So uh, we divided the IgG2A by the IgG1, and this gives you the Th1 to Th2 skewing. So if there's no skewing, um, it will be at a value of one. If it's Th1 skewed, it will be above one. And if it's Th2 skewed, it'll be below one. So what you can see for all of these vaccines actually is that they're all above one, around 10. Um, so they are Th1 skewed, which is good and promising. Um, but is actually really less specific to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and really to the platform. So most nucleic acid vaccines um, induce a Th1 skewed antibody response. So we also wanted to characterize the cellular responses. So um, we did this by um, taking out the splenoc splenocytes from vaccinated mice and re-stimulating them um, with the peptides from the spike protein, and then looking at uh, interferon gamma secretion. So on the y-axis, we have um, spot-forming units per million splenocytes. On the x-axis, we have all of our groups, so electroparted DNA, our rabies control, as well as the four different groups of self-amplifying RNA. Um, so what you can see here is that um, it actually looks like the electroporated DNA induced a really poor cellular response. Um, the level was actually at about 250 spot forming units per million cells. Um, but this is, this is actually a normal and actually generally thought to be quite good cellular response. Um, it's just that our RNA groups were really quite high in this case. So we were seeing up to about 2,500, 3,000 in our top groups um, spot forming units. Uh, so it seems that is not only does it induce a really high antibody response, but we're also seeing quite a robust cellular response from these RNA vaccines. Um, so the next question that, yeah, everybody likes to know is when will the vaccine be ready? So um, from February to May, we were doing the preclinical immunogenicity and toxicology. Um, we then submitted everything to the MHRA, to the regulators, and got approval for our clinical trial. Um, so that started last week. So our first phase is actually combined phase one and two, which we'll be looking at safety and immunogenicity. This will run from June to September um, and be trialed in 300 participants. Um, pending how the data from that looks, we'll then enter our phase three for efficacy. So seeing if it actually prevents uh, disease infection versus a placebo control. This is set to be trialed in 6,000 participants from September of this year to January of next year. Um, however, in preparation for kind of seeing those results in the efficacy trial, we have planned to make 85 million doses in December um, so that we'll be prepared for implementation whenever those results are ready and released. So kind of the last thing I want to think about is why, why are these RNA va vaccines so advantageous specifically for outbreaks? So um, the way, and it really comes down to the way we make vaccines. So for protein and viral vaccines, um, they, they just require a lot of resources to make. So on the left here um, is actually the way that we make the flu vaccine. So this was it being made in 1957 and then still the way that we make it in 2020. So it's grown in eggs, it's not a very high throughput way and it takes a lot of resources and manpower to do so. Other vaccines like viral vectors and proteins are grown in these huge bioreactors where you have to culture cells to be able to make the protein and then purify that out. And it's just a very time consuming and not that efficient process. 
However, um, RNA vaccines, specifically self-amplifying RNA, which is really, really potent, has a much smaller footprint to make, make the doses you require. So in about 100 milliliters, we're able to make 1 million doses if we use a one microgram dose of RNA like we're planning to use in our clinical trial. Um, so this is just a, a quote from Robin who called me, I guess, a, a few months ago now saying, I'm struggling to figure out how we're going to make 5 million doses. Um, and this was before we, we were tasked by the UK government to make 85 million doses, but it's, it's quite an international affair. So currently our RNA is made in California. Our lipids are made in Vancouver. Those two are shipped to Austria to be put into the formulation, um, which is then uh, shipped actually now to Italy to be put into vials and then shipped to the UK to um, be administered. So obviously this requires a lot of logistical challenges, making sure that you can get everything on time and it would just be much more advantageous to be able to do all of this in one country than relying on shipping it all over the world, which has, has a lot of um, logistical um, aspects to it. So I think in the future, kind of where I see this going is instead of having kind of these big manufacturing centers all over the world um, that, you know, make the RNA or make the limits or make the formulations, I think that we'll have more smaller centers where you can just locally manufacture GMP vaccines, um, and this will enable kind of a more robust and fast response to an outbreak. Um, so conclusions from this part is that we see our SARS-CoV-2 self-amplifying RNA vaccine um, induces higher antibody titers and neutralization than a natural infection in recovered COVID-19 patients. As far as our clinical trials are going, our phase one began last week, which is really exciting. Um, so fingers crossed that it works. And for the future challenges, um, we're able to I think we'll be looking to modular manufacturing of RNA um, that will really enable kind of a global response to future outbreaks. Um, so yeah, one of, the, one of the other questions that I was asked to prepare for this presentation was just how did I end up here? Um, and I think it's just really important to consider that there's kind of no one pathway and um, everybody has a kind of a different story as you're deciding in your career options. So, I actually am originally from Colorado. I went to the University of Colorado for my undergraduate degree, um, where I actually majored in chemical engineering, which is pretty different than the immunology lab that I work in now. Um, I then went on to do my PhD uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, I did my PhD in bioengineering, so that was more for drug delivery, also for the prevention of infectious diseases, so more specifically HIV. Um, but I didn't do my PhD specifically in vaccines. While I was at um, University of Washington, I got a fellowship to do part of my PhD at University of Cape Town in South Africa. And my advisor there, Heather Jaspin, is a close collaborator of Robin, so that's how I originally met him. Um, so after my time in Cape Town, I went back to the dub to finish up my PhD. And while I was there, I um, applied for a fellowship um, that is for was for American postdocs that they had to use outside of the states. So I applied for that with Robin, and that's how I ended up coming to Imperial. Um, so it's kind of just you know taking the opportunities that are out there, and yeah, there's there's lots of different tracks that people can take. So um, I moved here originally kind of for two reasons. So the first was to learn more about vaccines and um, be able to kind of learn more about immunology to complement my background in more in bioengineering, but also because I thought I would have tea with the queen, which I'm still waiting for. Um, so we'll see if that happens. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge all of the people that are involved in this research. So Robin and Paul and everybody in the lab. Um, it's been a really collaborative effort during this time. Um, and it's been really cool working on a project where everybody has just been so focused and able to make progress so quickly. Um, also, I'd like to thank our collaborators at Acutus who have done all of the lipid nanoparticle formulations for us, um, as well as the plastic surgeons that we work with at the NHS, Liz and June. And with that, I will take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Anna. That was um, extremely clear and interesting. Um, so thanks again. I'm just pulling up the questions. So the first one is, um, with the current lower infection rates in the UK, um, could it possibly slow down the progress of the trial? And is this clinical trial limited to the UK? 
Yeah, so that's a really qu good question. So um, that's really important for our phase three efficacy trial because obviously if people aren't getting infected, then um, you, know, you won't be able to tell if it's uh, working compared to the placebo. So that's something that we're thinking about. Um, so we've been talking, currently it's only set up to be in the UK. Um, so hopefully there will still be some infections here, but we've also been talking um, to expand it to places like Brazil and South Africa. So I think um, we also have thought about doing it in Uganda and Singapore. Um, so it's kind of really just depending on like where, where we're seeing viral infection still and, and where we can test the vaccine. But yeah, that's a really great question. Right. Um, so the next question is, um, what is the basis for self-replication? Yeah, so it's it's derived from an alpha virus. So it makes this replicase complex, um, which is an RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So essentially, as soon as that gets translated, once it's in the cell, it's able to go back and make a, copies of that original strand of RNA. Um, so it's really just hijacking kind of this viral machinery um, so that it's not infectious, but it's still able to replicate. Great. Um... And how specific are the IgG antibodies for SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, so we've looked at, um, I guess you're talking about cross-reactivity. So we've looked at cross-reactivity with some other coronaviruses. So we see a little bit of neutralization capacity for SARS, like a tiny bit, but it's not great, um, but, but nothing other than that. So we've also tested it against MERS and 229, but um, yeah, didn't see a lot of cross-reactivity there. Okay, that's a good sign. <laughs> um, and what kind of adverse effects are you anticipating in the human trials? Yeah, so it, it's hard to say. Um, because this type of RNA has never been tested in humans before, um, we really don't know. So it's, it's really exciting, um, but also obviously, you know, really important to get the safety right. Um, as I said at the beginning, because this is a, a completely synthetic platform, the safety concerns are much kind of less to begin with than a viral vector. Um, but I guess if we base it off of other like companies or organizations that have more data for RNA vaccines, I think typically what they see, um, if, if you use a really high dose, you can see kind of this interferon response, which manifests like you have a viral infection. So it's flu-like symptoms where you can get um, a fever, redness of the injection site, stuff like that. So hopefully we won't see any, fingers crossed. Um, so the next question is, do you think your vaccine will be more successful than the Oxford vaccine? <laughs> Great question. We actually um, have done a study in collaboration with um, the, the Chadox team. So I think like in the media, it often gets painted that we're, we're really competitive with each other. <laughs> uh, but I think kind of from a, a, the perspective of all scientists right now and just really everybody, it's just we want a vaccine that works. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we've been really collaborative with them and sharing. So hopefully that data will get published soon. But um, it actually, yeah, we've, so we've done a, com a combination study where we've looked at priming with ours and boosting with the Chadex or ch priming with the Chadex and boosting with ours. Mm -hmm. um, and they do seem to be quite complementary. So um, I think, yeah, it, it remains to be seen. They have kind of different advantages. Great. Um, so what do you think could be the reason behind the vast difference of doses between humans and other mammals, especially as the doses that you used are very similar to one another in them? Yeah, so so I think the, the main issue is really this interferon response. So I think humans over time have evolved to limit these, um, even in the animals that we test in preclinical models. So a lot of the mice we use are inbred mice. You know, they're kept it, for generations. They've been kept in completely clean conditions. And so they, they never see pathogens. They don't have like, big reactions to anything. And so I think this really does limit their response to the RNA. So if anything, they just over exaggerate how well it's going to work. Um, whereas for humans, obviously, you know, you're exposed to things all the time. And if you have a, a functional immune system, you know, you're really good at limiting that response. So I think that's the main reason for that. Um, and also, yeah, kind of the main reason why we need to think about how we're testing these vaccines before we go into human clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Um, I have another question here, which um, half of which you've already answered, but um, when you guys 
got the COVID-19 patient samples, how long after infection were those? Um... Yeah, so we, we actually don't have a lot of information about the timing or the severity of their disease. So what we know about those is that they were patients admitted to the hospital um, for COVID-19. So they at one point tested PCR positive. And then when they were leaving the hospital, they tested PCR negative. So that could be some one of the reasons why we don't see an IgG response in some of them is that it may have just been too soon after they had it to actually have a, a high antibody response. Um, so that's definitely something to take into consideration. But we also don't know, you know, if they were immunocompromised or if if they, um, you know, just didn't have a very like severe viral infection, but just had adverse events or something like that. Right. Um, so I'm going to pick two more questions because I know you need to go soon. So is there any data on the CD8 T response so far? Yeah, so we haven't looked yet specifically at CD8 T cells, um, but we are, yeah, continuing, continuing to do that in our ongoing studies. Great. Um, and then the last question is, what is your next career step? <laughs> Great question. So I actually um, recently accepted a position as an assistant professor at University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Um, so I will be moving there in January. Awesome. Great. Um, I think we're going to end it there. Uh, this presentation will be uploaded to um, on our YouTube account. So everyone will be able to access that. Thank you once again, Anna. I wish you all the best uh, with your future research and your next career step. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Thank everyone for coming. <laughs> See you all next time. Bye. Yeah. Bye.